Hello, everybody. Hope you all are doing well and keeping safe. And today we are going to talk about the road to the Civil War. I'm going to just go ahead and share the screen now. Get that up there. Same thing every every lecture is me fumbling around. <laughs> but anyway, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the how we've discussed how the country is moving towards Southern secession and civil war, and we've arrived at Lincoln's election, which is more or less the straw that broke that camel's back. We said right, and. The newspaper, the Charleston Mercury, reporting on Lincoln's election, said, and they're pulling up the spirit of the revolution here. See, the tea has been thrown overboard. This was on November the 8th, uh, 1860. Just six weeks later, when 160 South Carolina delegates voted unanimously to make the state, quote, an independent commonwealth. And this comes from, uh, a lot of today's lecture is coming from this book here, which I hope that you are keeping up with. Uh, but that's, that's from actually page 37 of that book. But after South Carolina, South Carolina seceded, the streets of Charleston especially were just filled with rebel rousers celebrating, cheering through all day, all night. Uh, these secessionists, uh, the sentiment was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and one by one, other southern states followed. Okay, and what followed this vote of independence was determined a determined effort by South Carolinians to recruit their neighbors to join this new commonwealth and assert their collective power and regional identity. And you've read about this effort in chapter three of Apostles of Disunion. Uh, the commissioners that individual states appointed, so for example, uh, in South Carolina, a lot, of this, a lot of today's lecture has to do with South Carolina because this movement started in Charleston. Uh, Andrew Calhoun, son of a uh, longtime advocate for secession, John C. Calhoun. Uh, Leonidas Sprice, who was referred to as the philosopher of the new African slave trade, that means Edmund Ruffin, who was a very passionate, uh, fire-eating secessionist. Uh, they, all these people, they fanned down to Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, um, and other states who convince these states to secede. And they're putting out you know, the fears that abolitionists, the Black Republican President Lincoln uh, was putting the institution of slavery uh, at harm. It, it, it is going to, with under Lincoln, we will lose our enslaved people. And in order to hold off the threat to these, what they called uh, immediate enemies, and again, black Republicans. Uh, here in Louisiana, secession took place on January the 26th of 1861. Uh, and in the early 61, these representatives were, uh, they're Remarkably, they're unified. Uh, South Carolina's headlong rush to secede required some explanation and justification to its neighbors, uh, particularly in light of the state's well-deserved reputation as the most radical of all slaveholding states. Uh, and accordingly, uh, the need to rally the South in the face of possible Northern military action made it uh, imperative that the commissioners hurry, get moving. Uh, the ideas that unified South Carolina with the rest of the South had to be spread. Uh, the Charleston Mercury, another newspaper, uh, reminded readers that, quote, indecision and delay were dangerous indulgences. Again, the South has to move fast on secession. Uh, and over and over again, these commissioners used the same language and called upon the same images. Uh, submission to the blind and ruthless fanaticism of the North uh, was not an option to them because submission meant acquiescence uh, in certain and the certain destruction of slavery. Uh, so what did Lincoln and war uh, represent to the South? Uh, emancipation, 
which would bring what they thought would be the degradation and annihilation of the white race in the South. Uh, the label for Lincoln and his party, the Black Republicans, they were said to be hell-bent on uprooting our institutions and desolating the Southern country. One commissioner explained the threat that justified secession very clearly. He said Lincoln has designs to abolish slavery and elevate our own slaves to an, equally, to an equality with ourselves and our children. I'm take that. Racial equality and the destruction of slavery was unacceptable. So, secession. And while the Confederate leadership was railing on Lincoln's hatred of slavery and the Deep South was very supportive of secession, it's important to note that the pro-secessionist sentiment was not unanimous in all of the Southern states. Some, called cooperationalists, preferred waiting for waiting to see what Lincoln would do. Let's see what could happen. They didn't want to uh, hurry into this. This is a big move, right? Uh, secessionists mounted strong arguments in favor of the constitutionality of secession. Are they argued that the union was a contract and you can opt out of this contract if you believe the terms of the, of the original agreement were being broken. Uh, they pointed to the refusal of some to return fugitive slaves, some Northerners, and the, some encouraged John Brown, the support for abolitionist causes and generals, all these represented a breach of this contract and therefore the right to withdraw. Upper South and border states did not secede immediately. Uh, this is eight states in total. They decided that Lincoln's election alone was not enough to justify this dramatic move. The secessionists established a new slaveholding republic called the Confederate States of America. They met in Montgomery, Alabama in February of 1861, and the Montgomery Convention produced essentially, it was moderate work. It wasn't, it was radical, but it was more moderate rather than the fire eaters who uh, could have controlled the convention. And this is not uncommon. Often these revolutionaries, uh, the real radicals who push things along are not included when it comes to making governments. And the Confederate and the United States constitutions offer a interesting and a telling comparison. Uh, the two documents are very, very similar. You can, they're almost, some part of it's almost word for word. Uh, specifically though, the big difference of the Constitution of the Confederate States protects slavery. And, more, and it uses the word slavery, which as you remember, the US Constitution did not use that word. The Confederate Constitution also protected state sovereignty in ways that the United States did not. The Confederate document denied central government a great deal of power. And the convention selected Jefferson Davis as a provisional president. He is a former Secretary of War under Franklin Pierce. He was a hero of the Mexican War, a prominent member of Congress, and a plantation and slave owner himself. Alexander H. Stevens was selected to be the Vice President. We'll get back to Stevens in a little while. But these two men were moderates. They were not extreme radicals in the whole spectrum of Southern politics and politicians. Again, why moderates? Um, they wanted to appeal to the Upper South, these states that had not yet seceded, that were literally and figuratively on the border. Terrible pun. So was this a revolution? And the delegates insisted that they were returning to the principles of 1776, which of course John Brown said the same thing. Uh, they said they were not carrying out a revolution. The objective they said was to preserve their system of labor and their social order based on the enslavement of the African. And of course, the irony is that secession failed to protect slavery. Remaining in the Union most certainly, almost certainly would have kept slavery around for a much longer time. Republicans had no plans or designs on killing slavery where it existed. Democrats still controlled Congress. There's 
no way that a constitutional amendment outlawing slavery could have passed, especially with Democrats in, in, uh, in control. You remember you need three quarters of the states to do such a thing. This was a huge gamble to secede and it was a bad bet. There's no questions from the first to the end that secession was about slavery, preserving this institute. After the war, many Southerners claimed that they were not concerned about slavery. It was a secondary, third, low down on the totem pole type issue. They were more worried about constitutional issues. And if we look at the actual historical evidence, which we have been, much of what you're reading, the words of these commissioners appointed by Southerners are very clear. So here we can see the order too is number, you know, the number, the states are number of South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, etc. And the nation acted to the news, reacted to the news of the secession in, in different ways. Some northern sentiment was divided initially. Many reacted with a wait and see what happens. Many Northerners rejected the Southern interpretation of the Union as a compact or contract that one could opt out of. Uh, they did not accept the arguments of the South. Many in the North worried that this threatened the mission of the United States in the, in the world abroad. So if the Southern states were allowed to destroy the Union, it means the end of the American democratic experiment. And of course, this is going to be Lincoln's powerful rallying point in the Gettysburg Address. Uh, but even believing this, many were not prepared to take drastic measures initially. They're not ready for a war. Our, the old doe-face president that we've spoken of, James Buchanan, was absolutely not. He was still president for the first few months of all, these, all this trouble all these secessions and he said that secession was illegal but that he was going to he was basically powerless to do anything about it unless the southern united the southern states be uh, became violent if there was any acts of violence it was not an armed rebellion this is words these are conventions and he didn't want to th make things worse by taking drastic measures he was basically he's on his way out he, he's like Lincoln's going to deal with this. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to retire now. And a president-elect Lincoln was also rather aloof. Uh, his early, the early, early efforts at compromise that were happening right at this point were failing. Uh, various plans were put out. There was the, the Crittenden, which I believe how you pronounce that, uh, Crittenden Compromise after a Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky, which was uh, to extend the uh, Missouri Compromise Line from coast to coast, just bring it all the way over there through parts of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, California, etc., cetera, uh, and to put an unrepealable constitutional amendment that would protect slavery forever. Republicans said no. Uh, the main, their, their main plank was no extension of slavery, and they would not, uh, that slavery would not extend to the West. And Southerners also reject these, these proposals. They wanted to be able to expand slavery with no restrictions. So, Lincoln is facing a very, very volatile situation as he takes office in March of 1861. He, well, seven states had left the Union and formed a separate nation, and the other slave states may follow. And key to understand, it's key to understand though that not all of the slave states seceded when Lincoln took office even. Uh, Northern opinion was starting to harden against the Deep South and secessionists, and it remained divided, of course. Uh, more and more people in the North were getting comfortable with the idea of coercing Southern states back into the Union. Many Northern and Southern businessmen were worried that their interests would be harmed if the Union were to split. So you think about bankers down here in New Orleans and Boston and New York, they all need each other. Lincoln's first inaugural address set a stern tone. He promised to leave slavery alone and try to reassure the, the slave holding South. Also, he said he would support a constitutional amendment where it already existed. So again, something that's missed upon by, maybe by some Southern politicians, that's, that 
slavery would have continued for a much longer time had secession not happened, had it stayed in the Union. But Lincoln, and he did reiterate, he would not compromise on the question of slavery into the territories. He stands by his decisions or his thoughts about keeping it where it is. Uh, slavery was going to be forbidden in the new federal territories. He also condemned uh, secession unequivocally. He was not, he was opposed to it. He said he would quote, hold, occupy, and possess all the US property in those seceded states. So he was determined to take, to make no offensive moves. He wanted the South to be responsible for any violence. He did not want to be seen as the aggressor. No one did. Lincoln, therefore, he kind of put the ball in the Confederacy's court. But he said that it all rests on the shoulders of my dissatisfied fellow countrymen. And he says fellow countrymen because he does not believe in society. He does not believe that the southern states are a part of a new union, what some people today call the so-called Confederacy. Hold, occupy, possess. That's the strategy. What did this apply? So, what did this apply to when Lincoln was talking about U.S. property in the South? That's another thing, right? There was only four military installations under U.S. control in these seceded states, and only two of them really mattered, Fort Pickens in Florida and Fort Sumter in Charleston, in the harbor there. We'll get back to Sumter later. It's important. Um, I'm giving you the basic outline of Lincoln's philosophy and approach as he took off after secession. Uh, but before, what was the Confederacy doing in the winter and the spring of 61 before this war? Well, in a speech before the Virginia Secession Convention in 1861, late May, I'm sorry, late April, uh, in the wake of the fire, right before the firings on Fort Sumner, newly elected or appointed, whichever he was, Vice President Alexander Stevens gave a speech that is today referred to as the Cornerstone Speech. Remember that, the Cornerstone Speech. He was a Georgian, Stevens was a Georgian, a slaveholder, and he gave this ex kind of improv extemporaneous speech where he described the meaning and purpose of the Confederate States of America. And he did not justify secession with Lincoln's election or with federal intervention on states' rights. Not at all. That is not what he's saying here. He explained it very simply that the Confederacy uh, the, was the cornerstone of the Confederacy, sorry, was what he called American Negro slavery. It was because of slavery that the Confederacy withdrew from the United States, not Lincoln's election, not infringement on states' rights of any sort. It is the preservation of slavery. He says, quote, as a race, the African is inferior to the white man. Subordination to the white man is his normal condition. He is not as equal by nature. It cannot be made so by human laws or human institutions. Our system, therefore, so far as regards this inferior race, rests upon this great immutable law of nature. Yeah. How nature, how, sorry, how slavery is natural. And some others that you can see here, this stone, which was rejected by the first builders, is the cornerstone. The new constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institutions. African slavery as it exists among us, the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and moral condition. That's a lot to take in, especially if, uh, if perhaps you've heard differently about why the South would secede. He is, Stevens is clearly expressing the central mission of the Confederacy, the preservation of black slavery. And I wanna make sure you all understand that Stevens' emphasis understand what he is emphasizing here. He's not 
talking about states' rights or Lincoln's president, presidency, but the preservation of the brutal institution of forced labor. So again, like in the 1850s, with uh, incidences like the Anthony Burns case, uh, Fort Sumter, a US military fort in Charleston Harbor, became the critical symbolic post because South Carolina is demanding that the United States abandon what they say is their, it's their property. It's in their territory and it is theirs. They, need, they want the United States soldiers to leave immediately. And a ring, it was, the fort was surrounded by cannons. Uh, and the, so there's a message here that we will fire upon you if you do not get out of here soon enough. Uh, and this situation is growing critical because the fort was low on supplies and had been for some time. Buchanan had authorized a small expedition of supplies in January of 61, but they were fired upon and could not make it to the fort. And now it's Lincoln's turn to deal with it. And he decided to resupply the fort. And although many told him that they should just abandon it, he thought that public opinion would turn against him though if he did that. And he wanted to make it as uncontroversial as possible. He told the governor of South Carolina there is going to be a vessel. It is unarmed. It is only bringing food and supplies, not men, not materials for war. So again, passing the buck, the balls in Jefferson's court. Of course, the Confederates perceived this as a hostile act and violence erupted. The morning of April 12th, the cannons in Charleston, Charleston Harbor erupted and the fort's garrison, commanded by Major Robert Anderson, who was a Kentuckian, fired back. And some of you may know that the general in charge who ordered the fires be shot upon the fort uh, was from New Orleans General Beauregard, whose statue most of you wouldn't remember. Uh, I don't think you were here, but his statue was right at the entrance of City Park here, and it was removed when the rest of them were about three years ago. And there's another image of it. Uh, so this exchange continued for several hours, and then on, in, in, the next day on the 13th, the shooting stopped, Anderson surrendered, and uh, there was only one casualty, a U.S. soldier was killed uh, during a uh, farewell salute as the flag was coming down. And there's an actual picture of the fort after the battle. You can see that's not the United States flag right there. That is probably the South Carolina battle flag. I honestly don't know what that is. Um, but this events in April of 61 brought forth immediate action. Uh, the, the US flag had been fired upon. The South was the aggressor. So now the people are geared up for war. Now, one northerner wrote, it seems as if we were never alive till now, never a country till now. And one Boston man wrote, I never knew before, I never before knew what a popular excitement can be. Uh, so Lincoln's strategy of making the South fire first united the North. So on April 15th, Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to suppress this rebellion. And also, right then, four states in the Upper South seceded. Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia, which Virginia, as you all know, became the capital of the Confederacy. So 11 slave states have now joined the Confederacy. Four slave states remain in the Union. Uh, the war began, and most people thought it was going to be a brief, short war. Both sides were thinking this. So, what was going on at the Confederacy by the end of 61, when things were just starting to get ramped up. So secession went really well for them. Uh, on December 20th, 1861, the first anniversary, uh, Fort Sumner had fallen that April. Confederate leaders had selected, on purpose obviously, George Washington's birthday to celebrate the occasion of secession and to inaugurate the new government, quote, on this birthday of the man most identified with the establishment of American independence, Jefferson Davis was saying, uh, we hope to perpetuate the principles of our revolutionary fathers. The day, the memory, and the purpose seemed fitly associated. 
by February of 61, Jefferson Davis was speaking much less frequently about slavery and much more about the inheritance of the founding generation. Davis argued, rather than disingenuously, really, uh, that the South was simply trying to preserve, quote, the experiment instituted by our revolutionary fathers. He's linking the CSA and the Revolutionary War. Uh, they, um, of course, this is very disingenuous, as I said. The Revolutionary Fathers were the cloak, though, which helped obscure the true meaning behind the Confederacy, as well, though, as like a, kind of as a, uh, a blessing. Uh, the iconography of the Revolution uh, gave Southerners this vocabulary to, and a, like a conceptual framework to base their, uh, their claims for their legitimacy. There are essays, speeches, newspaper articles, songs, poems, all talking about the virtuous nation of the Confederacy that had been the people, though, of the Confederacy once were led astray by greedy, power-hungry Yankees. The question here is the symbolism and use of history by the Confederacy. On December 24th of 61, the Charleston Courier, another newspaper, gave this impassioned account of the first anniversary uh, as it was being celebrated. It said, quote, the Confederate and state flags floated over the Custom House, the old exchange, which connects, connects Charleston of this day with the Charleston of colonial history and with the names and services of Lawrence, Gadsby, Pickney, and their peers of 1776. So it's almost as if they're saying colonial, uh, the colonial South Carolina and the Confederate South Carolina are much more aligned. And there was this kind of aberration where we were this union, but it was clearly a failed experiment. Uh, the Courier's coverage made it clear that this um, new Confederate, Confederate States of America connected its present and its uh, future to the revolutionary past. The same union that the union celebrated, the same, yeah, same union, the same past, sorry, that the union celebrated on the 4th of July. Uh, the Confederacy and its partisans would continue to do so long past the Civil War. Uh, they sought justification, spiritual solace and the heroes of the founding uh, and later in the Confederate generations. Uh, and this was their worldview. And much like Lincoln would approach the Confederacy, historians have also treated the CSA as an uncomfortable chapter in American history. Uh, some wanted to forget it, uh, and it is uncomfortable. Uh, the days of national remembrance underscore a particularly Lincolnian understanding of the Civil War. Uh, the Confederacy is treated, the so-called Confederacy is treated as a rebellion in the 16th president, president's uh, political logic. Uh, if we believe the Confederacy is still part of the Union, it still is. We just pretend it didn't secede. It's still part of us. We're just fighting it now. He persistently maintained to the public, uh, past and since, uh, that the Confederacy never really left. Uh, and when the Courier expanded on his coverage of the first anniversary of South Carolina's secession, uh, they kind of stoked their, the, the state's place at the American vanguard. Citizens conversant with our history recalled and mentioned the fact that South Carolina achieved in 1719 the first revolution on American soil for the vindication and assertion of a great principle of constitutional government. That South Carolina in 1776 was the first of the American colonies to declare independence and that South Carolina is the only state whose secession dates to 1860. That, that history of secession, just, just a year old, inspired pride amongst a lot of people in South Carolina. Uh, the Courier's, Courier's efforts at canvassing the, public, the, canvassing the public, asking questions, but, uh, do you regret the actions of this day, produced similar results. The answer their paper noted in almost all cases was an emphatic and decided no. Uh, the report happily added that others regretted that South Carolina had not seceded earlier and that other states had not gone with or soon after her. They wanted it to be even faster. It seems. Under a notion of going forth with the future, the, the paper assessed the state's experiment with secession. 
triumph or one eventful year, the article explained, uh, the dawns of approaching success, of approaching success, success, now brightens the horizon. That horizon was certainly looking good, looking rather hopeful. Uh, they were offering cheerful beams, cheerful faces beaming forth unchanged and unchangeable resolution. Um, it is healthy for a nation to look back, sure. Uh, people find meaning and hope and, and trials and tribulations of the forefathers. Uh, so it's not surprising that, in, that as a nation we have a hard time understanding the Confederate States of America. Uh, it's far from an aberration, uh, far from a rebellion. The South, beginning with South Carolina, uh, became a separate nation, uh, and nowhere more so than its own eyes, though. The coherence and pride with, with that its citizens met their first anniversary underscores the complexity of the war that they were fighting, and it's perfect. It's profoundly chaotic and bitter aftermath. Uh, what was clear on that first anniversary was how deeply the Confederacy would cultivate an alternative identity, one with different symbols, holidays, heroes, it constantly in conflict with those of the United States. The unchangeable resolution of December 20th 61 speaks to what would become a drawn out brutal war, but it also perpetuated conflict between region and between nation. A new history is, is being born in South, starting with South Carolina this first, at this first year anniversary, uh, and one that would really not be undone with defeat and reunion and re reconstruction and any other efforts. We're going to stop there. Uh, we're going to continue tomorrow. And as I say, I hope you're all keeping up with your readings in Apostles of Disunion by Drew. I do. I uh, can assure you there will be some questions on the final that come from here. And email me if you have any questions. So.